another video about E3D? You're gonna love this one. I mean, you've seen the title. This is a tour of the E3D headquarters. You've seen what Prusa Research looks like. You may have also seen what MCPP, formerly Dutch Filaments, look like, uh, depending on when each of these videos from the road trip gets published. And each one of these companies are just radically different in how they work. So E3D are about 50 employees right now, and we're going to check out what they do all day from research and development, quality control, marketing, customer support, packaging, and shipping, and all the other bits that make a company like this work. Welcome to beautiful Oxfordshire. As you can see, it's uh, well typical English weather. And I'm here today for E3D. So we've got Sanjay here. Hi. And this is, this is your new operation, right? Yeah, yeah, we've merged five buildings into one. We moved in here in January. It's a, it's a much bigger, much better space. Yeah, should we take a look around? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's come inside. Let's go. We've got our 3D printed plaque. Yeah. So we're basically going to try to follow the life of a hot end, right? From yeah. conception to you know, actually being shipped Absolutely. out to a customer. Yeah, right. all the way through. This is the, the commercial team. They look after all of our customers in kind of every way. Um, marketing, videos, all the great content you see on the website, um, through to customer service on the web chat, Slack, Discord, all of that good stuff. Um, so over here we have what is broadly marketing and then moving, transitioning over to what is customer service and the guys that also look after all of our big printer manufacturers and resellers all over the world. Yeah, and and I guess that that is something that um, people might not know that are just buying your stuff. You're not just selling the E3D V6 and, and Titan, etc., but you're also oh. making products for you know big brands that maybe not be labeled E3D right yeah, now? Yeah, there's a yeah. lot of that. Um, and nowadays, I suppose in comparison to perhaps um, even just 18 months or two years ago, the majority of our business is composed of business-to-business -business sales, be that resale or manufacturer for other printers. Um, it's for, yeah, printer manufacturers and, yeah, a quite significant proportion of the hot ends and extrusion systems that we sell to printer manufacturers are not labeled as E3D. They're hot ends that are built for their specific application and machine, but made by us. This is, this is probably the most corporate space you guys have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it feels very corporate, actually, compared to... Yeah. Well, you were here... I was surprised. Yeah, you were here last year. But yeah, we came and we built this whole upper space. Um, so this was just warehouse, like a big high ceilinged warehouse. Yeah. And we built these extra rooms, these, the whole floor and the ceiling um, and all of these rooms. So we got, got to kind of spec it out as we wanted. So we got the green walls and we got the glass partitions for the meeting rooms and yeah. stuff like that. So we went a bit fancy. Um, <laughs> but it was it's nice because it's a place that we've kind of made our own and we can settle into. Yeah. So now that we have the, the boring stuff kind of covered. Yeah. Yeah. We'll go what's through up next? into here. So here we've got um, engineering, where all the R&D takes place and where we do all the work for our printer manufacturers, be that kind of quality control stuff, automation, these sorts of things, that all happens in here. That's what all these guys are working on. Our bank of kind of test machines. We've got the kind of sprint board going on, which is how we organize all our tasks and what we're doing. Um, so that's kind of nice and physical. So you have the magnetic cards that you can move around. Yeah. In this two-week sprint, I'm working on this. Um, this moves forwards and everyone gets a little magnetic head to assign what it is they're up to. We are going to talk about a lot of these little kind of details where you're improving your, your processes and, and kind of checking quality along the way and yeah. you know, as we move into production and, and assembly, right? Yeah, all those things are... They're probably some of the biggest challenges in maturing and scaling is these these tiny little things and figuring out where in the process yeah. the pain points are and then building machines and automation. It's it's, it's always at 80-20, right? Yeah. Yeah. Eighty percent of the work is easy and but the, the rest makes it good. Yeah. And I think that also oh. What you see externally is kind of the tip of the iceberg as well, because you, I don't know, you see a V6 hot end or a small addition to it, but then the amount of testing and QC and what it takes to actually get a product like that onto the market in a kind of a mature, tested fashion, which is perhaps a little different to how things in, were. In a consistent way, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and welcome to R&D, the workshop. We're developing the fan duct for Titan V2. Um, and also the cooling fan for the heatsink. So there are two fans. There's a print cooling fan and there's a heatsink cooling fan. Um, 
And what we don't want to happen is for the heat sink cooling fan to create breezes around your print that could upset the print. And so what we do is we mount our test object onto this fixture, which is basically a repurposed printer. And there's a hot wire anemometer here. Yeah. And so we can start the fan on the print head that's cooling the heat sink and we move the print head around relative to the hot wire anemometer and we can basically scan for airflow down below the print head yeah. so we can look for air disturbance. You're mapping out where the um, the air actually blows over your print relative to the, to the nozzle. Correct. Where it should be blowing yeah. or it shouldn't be blowing. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And so we use that for two things. One is to make sure that the heat sink fan isn't blowing air onto your print and disturbing it. Yeah. And the other is to make sure that the print cooling fan is super effective and concentrated and pushing lots of air where it should be. So it's a really neat dual purpose rig. I'll show you the um, impact that has had on our updates for Titan actually. So now we've, uh, we're creating a new heatsink for Titan that causes the air to be vented upwards or based on the research and data out of this. This machine is currently wear testing our new Ulti nozzle. We don't know what we're going to call it when it gets to market now, but it's um, kind of an updated hardened steel nozzle that can operate at higher temperatures because hardened steel begins to temper at the higher temperatures. You get it above 300, 350, and some of that, a small amount of that hardness begins to temper away. So we've gone for a steel that tempers at much higher temperature so we can stay much harder, much hotter and then we coat it in first an electroplating coating of a um, super hard nickel and then we add a nano coating to the outside that prevents the um, hot plastic sticking to it so we're kind of taking it's all of it's kind of a no holds barred um, approach to making a nozzle let's use the, the the best steel we can possibly make the nozzle out of let's add the best platings one on top of the other um, and try and get all of the benefits into a single nozzle where possible. This is a hot end slash extruder torture rig and we hook up a whole pile of extruders to it and we have a bunch of g-code scripts that abuse the hot ends in various ways so repeated retracts, um, extremely hard ramp purges, long slow printing, all of these things that can yeah. like cause issues and we can hook up four or five extruders along here so and then run it for many, many hours. All being tested at the same time and you just see how, how long they go until they fail. Yeah, yeah, essentially. Um, the, the destroyer. The destroyer, <laughs> yeah. This is, this is testing. Um, so this is, this kind of bench over here is for more long-term testing, whereas that is for active R&D. So based and informed from the research from the um, hot wire anemometer that measures airflow, around the print head. We've redesigned this aero heatsink. So it's now, instead of being machined, we're gonna die cast it because it allows us to have a bit more geometric freedom in the ways that we want it. So we can create a better heatsink um, for lower cost in higher volumes much quicker. So this is part of kind of E3D growing up, if you like, and um, because our friends at Lulzbot are consuming huge numbers of these die cast parts, it actually makes economic and manufacturing sense to go to die casting. So what's neat here is you can see we've got more fins, they're thinner, and the exit vents of the fins point up. So when the fan blows in, the air comes up instead of to the sides, and it means that you get a lot less air disturbance around the print head. So when you're printing ABS, ASA, etc., less of that cracking and warping. This is a visually boring, but actually really exciting piece of fundamental research we're undertaking. So we, um, we work very closely with our heater manufacturers and they make them exactly how we want them from the materials that we want them. Um, so we are, trying to develop a heater cartridge that uses a different type of heating element inside that's made from a new and different material that um, self-regulates as it heats up. So as the heater gets hotter, the resistance of the heater and therefore the current and the power, um, well, the resistance increases, thus decreasing the current and the power. Uh, so what that means in practice is that as the heater gets to a higher temperature, its power levels drop off. And that means that you can get to a printing temperature rapidly 
but you can't exceed certain temperatures. Yeah. It simply physically won't allow it. That's So basically you could just run this thing with no control at all and just pump power into it and it's not going to destroy it. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, so you could if, have a... If everything else fails on the printer, this is not going to. Yeah, your firmware can fail, the MOSFET can burn open um, and your power supply can remain on and this thing will not allow the aluminium heater block to overheat. Yeah. Um, and it will, it should, we think, actually decrease heat up times because that yeah, extra... You get more power in the, in the colder. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So the safety margin lets us put more power at the start where you want it. When you're heating from 100 to 200, you've got loads of power. So you might have like 45, 50 watts starting off at cold. But when you get up to 300 watts, 300 degrees centigrade, um, your wattage might drop down to 20, 25 thus limiting you safely. And then we have the rest of the, this is a kind of prototyping shop. So laser cutters, all the kind of tools you might expect, laser cutters, um, grinders, vices, chop saws, pillar drills. Manual machining still has a big place in prototyping. Oh yeah. CNC machining is great and all, but when you need to just make a small thing, oftentimes making the G-code is just as time consuming and arduous yeah. is actually. And you, you do have a, a CNC right here, but you're not using that for actual production parts. Or no, no. Runs. This is this all is, prototyping, basically. Yeah, this is all just prototyping. So this thing over here is just for knocking up little things quickly. Um, it's a nice machine. The Tormac system is nice because it really it connects with Fusion 360 really well, and the cam tool chain is really smooth. Yeah. And you can go from a design to a part really, really super easily. Like, they're not the most rigid machine in the world. They don't have the highest power spindle or like the greatest material removal rate or anything like that. Um, yeah, but it's kind of like with 3D printers, right? Exactly so. The, the ones that, that get you to the goal the easiest are the ones that Precisely get Precisely so. Yeah. And so this is about speed and ease of use and really Tormac has done fantastically well at that. So to take you through the life of an E3D product, uh, we start with goods in. So everything comes in onto the shelving over here. And the first thing that happens is it has to go through QC. So this is where goods get booked in. Um, and then we have the shelves. So at the moment, you can see some of the stuff that's on, that's been rejected. It's got to go back. It's got to have a non-conformance report filed and go back to the manufacturer. This stuff is questionable and therefore on hold. And so that will get stuck on the shelves um, until it either passes or gets failed, sent back to manufacturer. This sort of testing doesn't happen for 100% of, of the products you ship out, right? Because at the volumes, I mean, how many, how many hardens do you have in, in store here right now? Yeah, that's a good question. Tens of thousands. Probably. Tens of tens yeah. of thousands. Yeah. So you're um, not you're not really testing every single one um, to be you know perfectly on spot, but you you're kind of doing it more efficiently. Yeah. Yeah. So well, it depends on the component. So some components that need safety critical testing or stuff, stuff that runs on mains like a, a power supply or a high powered heated bed, they get 100% QC. But then if we look at say um, machined parts or injection molded parts, the manufacturing process for those things is so consistent um, within a batch that you can take 10%, 5% or what have you, depending on the process and the part, and you can measure those and be quite sure that the rest of them will be in spec. So there are different sample rates for different components um, and different escalation procedures should there be failures or lack of tolerances. Um, but all of that is kind of codified in our internal documentation. So there's a whole, we use the same Dazuki platform that we put our documentation on for our customers. We have a whole internal Dazuki that has all the electronic work instructions for assembling everything, as well as all the instructions for quality control of everything. Um, over here is the slightly more interesting um, QC stuff. So this thing um, uses collimated light and a high resolution camera, and it will effectively, you can take a part, pop it on here, um, ensure that it's focused, hit the button, and it will tell you all the dimensions. It's effectively a witchcraft, um, and it does it um, with kind of micron resolution. Um, and I am shocked at how accurate it is. Um, you can verify all these numbers with calipers because I did not trust that it was able to do that. I like sat there for ages and yeah, it's pretty on point. Um, 
So it'll give you all the radiuses, diameters, distance between lines, and so on and so forth. It will do that automatically. You can just put a part in, in whatever orientation you so please, um, and it'll figure things out for simple geometries. Um, However, what we do is we will program it so that it knows what, for example, a heater block looks like on this side. Um, and you can then just put 10 heater blocks on the bed, hit the button, it will count the heater blocks and then produce a report, um, dump that out to a database with all the data. It will highlight the ones that have passed in green, the ones that have failed in red, tell you why the ones that's failed has failed, log that all to the database. Um, yeah, it's yeah, pretty. That, that is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> and so it speeds up our QC for simple geometric parts probably about tenfold. Uh, it's, yeah, well, you, you throw 10 on there. You throw 10 yeah. on there, and in one second, it does 10 measurements of all 10 parts. So it's replacing 100 measurements in one second that yeah. would normally take maybe half an hour to do that amount yeah, of stuff. Yeah, sure. So it's, it's a huge increase in productivity. So once something has passed QC, um, it will usually go over here into pre-packing and minor assembly. So the, the bearing and the pin that goes into it, um, they have to be pressed in, and those are done by hand by these guys. They also look after ensuring that the flash is removed from the hole and that this hole is reamed to be burr-free because there's a bearing surface and this holds the PTFE, so they have to be perfect internally. So these guys look after all of that stuff. Um, but they do a whole multitude of things, pressing the, um, the Bowden coupling inserts into heat sinks, um, all manner of things. And it's just, you know, it's, it's repeatability. The customer is going to look at the packaging and they're going to see, okay, this is exactly the same thing I got last time. There's no deviation. Absolutely. And it also helps with recognition in process. Um, so if we know that, a, you know, a 24 volt heater bag looks like this and something else looks like that, it, you know, it helps with the recognition yeah. um, and also counting and knowing how many there are. If they're consistently, we know that that box, when you pack it like that, holds 300. Um, it lets you know how much is in process rather than just like all throwing it into an inconsistent yeah. box. This is what we call bulk packing over here. So these guys are packing products that would go to customers or resellers directly um, for the most part. Um, and over here is where we assemble the large packages of, um, yeah, so th these are for a particular week of Prusa. And yeah, each box here contains a thousand heater cartridges. Um, of their specific type. This is, I think, 5,000 sensors. Um, we've got heater blocks. I think these are heat breaks. Again, 1,000 per bag. So that is for product which um, goes out to the customer unassembled. So as parts, and they build them into their machine because that's the more convenient way for them to do them. Um, if we come on through here, we have the assembly line. These are boxes with model beds in them. Finally, the boxes have arrived. Um, so they're just being packed up, um, quality controlled. But a lot of these guys' time is consumed making these, which are basically pre-assembled hot ends, boxed. This is where the, the actual you know, assembled V6s are being built. Yeah. Every single one is built here. It's being hot tightened, it's being Correct. Screwed together by a human. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so these guys over here do what we call the cold assembly, which is, well, if you come over here, it's kind of interesting. So, you know, I discussed the electronic work instructions. All the guys have their documentation on tablets that they follow. Ooh, um, fancy. Yeah. And so it means you can keep the documentation live updated if you need to change something that all works out. Um, so these guys will screw together a hot end, put the nozzle into the heater block, get everything into place, clip on the fan, and so on and so forth. And then we call that a cold assembled hot end. Once the hot end is cold assembled uh, in the new system, which we're launching in a couple of weeks, every single hot end receives a barcode that gets clipped onto it, onto the heater cartridge. Um, we have a heater cartridge test rig that is network connected and has a barcode scanner on it. So the hot end goes over, gets barcode scanned. The heater cartridge gets plugged into the test rig, which measures its power and its resistance. It also checks that the insulation is all correct and other kind of factors that make sure the heater's safe and working properly. That's one of the barcodes and that gets tagged. That'll go around the kind of heater cartridge wires as such. Um, 
that gets scanned. It's got a little screen on it and you hear a beep and then you insert the heater cartridge into the go, no go gauges over here. So that's, that's just for mechanical size? Yeah, yeah. that checks mechanical size. And, and yeah, the, the, the end goal with this entire thing is to have like full accountability for the entire product. So Precisely in so. the end with, with those tags, with the barcodes or with, the, with that number, you, you plan on setting up something like Prishament where you can just enter that barcode, that label and get the full checklist of what's happened to this thing? Exactly, absolutely. You'll know who's tested it. Um, you will know the resistance when it was tested, the leakage to case, yeah. the insulation for, and that's just the heater cartridge. So that data gets uploaded. The same kind of deal happens with the sensor. So sensors connect here and here, um, and that will measure those and check all of their Again, leakage to case, resistance, um, and I believe that it has a thermistor in there that measures ambient, so we can compare known ambient to what the thermistor yeah. is measuring, so we can just check that that's same. Once that is all cold assembled and verified over here, then it gets moved over to one of the rigs. So you'll stack five V6s along here, cold assembled, and you plug them into their various rigging over here. Once that that's full, it goes onto this. Again, network connected test rig. It's on like so. That gets clamped into place. The act of clamping that into place connects all of the hot ends via pogo pin connections um, to the machine. So once that happens, then you can enable or disable, let's say you only have four of your five in there. You can select 12 or 24. You can hear the relays Go. switching between the different power supplies and then you tell it heat them all up. Um, so we need to heat them all up so that we can hot tighten them, which accounts for the thermal expansion and ensures that they remain sealed at high temperature. But the act of heating them up also verifies and sense checks that the heater cartridge and sensor are working properly. Uh, the thing with heaters and sensors is they have a lot of what we call cradle death. So on their first, you might measure their resistance cold, um, but on their first heat up cycle, they might experience some issues or degradation. So this will run them through a couple of cycles of heat up, cool down, heat up, cool down, and will ensure that they can maintain temperature. And that whole graph of them heating up and cooling down and ma maintaining temperature, etc. And you can even see them being hot tightened, the act of hot tightening heat sinks them sli slightly. That whole graph gets logged and is again on the same database along with the heater cartridge and sensor data over there. So that all goes up and then that unclips from here, goes over to here and this little rig, same as the one we discussed upstairs, is just some really powerful fan blowers. So that just cools the hot ends down quickly um, and they have it connects to the hot end so that it can sense the temperature and know when they've cooled down. And so for health and safety, we have these bright um, RGB LEDs. So when the hot end is too hot to touch, i.e. over 50 degrees centigrade, they are bright red. And then once they cool down to a temperature where they're safe to remove and move on and stack on the shelf for the next process, then they turn green. So that whole system is actually tied together with the work ordering system. So when a customer issues us a PO, a PO goes into the purchase order, i.e. a request for goods. Um, that goes into the system and it pops up on this screen here, which tells the guys what they need to manufacture and when for um, and how many are built. And so that will link up with the data capture system on all of those. So we're beginning to start trialing this with our high volume printer manufacturer consumers like Lulzbot and BCN. And so in the initial instance, they will receive basically an Excel spreadsheet with all of that data for every single hot end. Um, in due course, customers will be able to go onto the website and have see those graphs and all of that data by scanning in their own barcode. But at the moment, it's just a fantastic piece of QC and quality assurance so that we can show the manufacturer that we're doing our due diligence and we can trace back errors from whence they came. This is how BCN 3D will receive their hot end. So they get a sealed baggie um, with the SKU, the barcode, et cetera, all on there. At the moment, that barcode is just the SKU, but we will be printing an additional barcode, which is the hot end ID that allows them to look up the data. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess the, the end goal, if you're shipping to printer manufacturers like BCN or with Prusa, uh, is to, to have it all tied together at their facilities too. Precisely so. So when, when, when you get that, that uh, printout at Prusa, 
actually also see, okay, this thing has been tested by E3D and yep. got these, these, these values. So it's, it's not like redundant work they have to do. E exactly yeah. so, exactly. Once everything's made, either in parts or as fully assembled hot ends, it comes through here to front of house, which is where things get packaged and dispatched. So if you order an E3D hot end or an E3D nozzle from our website, it will come from here and these guys will pick, pack and dispatch it. So that works by, well, we have pretty much every single E3D product, um, at least one or two of each. So what will happen when you place an order is within about 30 seconds of your order being placed, down here will be printed a picking list. So we have the, this guy's just ordered a V6 Hot End 175, fairly common. So what will happen is a barcoded tray gets picked up, um, the note goes in the barcoded tray, the products get picked on this side by one person, um, and then the picked tray of parts, so it might be one part, it might be a hundred parts, um, the pick tray of parts goes over here and what we have here is the photography system. So in order to reduce mistakes and catch unfortunate things when sometimes people try and claim they haven't received goods when they actually have, um, we have a high definition camera and you pop the tray under here with the delivery note, you scan it over here and it takes a picture of everything in the tray. So you know exactly what's been picked and it all gets spread out. And then from there, it comes over to packing and shipping. So one person will pack the goods, uh, one person will pick the goods and then another person will pack the goods and each person here will pick and check and they'll go through the delivery note and ensure that everything's correct in there as well. And then finally, um, it, it gets scanned. So a little bit of the delivery note gets peeled off and put on the outside. That's got a barcode note on it. And that ships a product, informs the shipper, they come and pick it up and it goes off and finds you wherever you are in the world. Yeah, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is how your E3D products make it from, from here to you, wherever you are in the world. So yeah, thanks, Andrew. No for worries, man. It's my for, pleasure. For the tour, yeah. And uh, well, thank you all so much for watching. And special thanks to my patrons who make this all possible. There's Francisco Peebles, Christopher Day, Marcus Holmes, Dexter Schillet, Brian Raker, and Jonathan Marlin in the shout out here. And you can join in too for monthly hangouts and more. Also, remember to get subscribed if you aren't already. And I will see you all in the next one. Ah!